Uh, the apocalypse is the, is the unveiling of the untimed, in times. That's what the word apocalypse means. And it's important, when we went through Revelation, you'll remember when we went through that book, I kept reminding you, this was written for the people suffering for Jesus in the first century. And we draw application out of that to the extent that we identify with them. Uh, it's very critical. Second Thessalonians is such a book uh, as well. So let's, let's do a, just a snapshot summary, then an outline summary, and then a more uh, extended summary before we get into things like the, the, the introduction, the, the background, the authorship, the date, things like that. Um, as, the, as the video said, Paul's written this previous letter, 1 Thessalonians, and problems have continued to rise in an increasing way in the church. Uh, some false teachers have come in, and they have uh, they've either brought letters claiming to be from Paul or themselves just claiming to be, represent Paul, have said that the day of Christ had already occurred. You can imagine now. Uh, People who had been taught that uh, it'll be like a thief in the night when you least expect it. And then someone comes along and says, Paul says that it's already happened. What are the implications of that for me? If I've, if I've missed the day of the Lord, what hope remains for me? And so you can see that. So there's, a, there's kind of a, and as you read commentaries on this book, by the way, some will say that... Uh, that this is this is the problem that they've that they've missed the day of the Lord, or that the day of the Lord is approaching, which would explain perhaps why the the whole problem with idleness that we talked to you before when we looked at First Thessalonians a couple of weeks ago. That every now and then you read about this group that their leader was convinced that he knew the day Jesus was returning, and so they will sell all their possessions. I mean, why? Why are you going to hang on to them? You don't need them, and they would move off somewhere in a compound or a, a mountaintop and wait. And there may be some of that mentality. We don't know exactly on the sliding scale where these people were, but we know it was discouraging to them. We know it was very troubling to them, and uh, and it, it spun off different responses: fear, discouragement, idleness. Paul's trying to address this. That's a result of a doctrinal error that's being taught them. And so he gives this, uh, you're familiar with it, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, for even if we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. You can imagine that would be a burden on the congregation in terms of what we talked about this morning, the whole love feast and, and the culture and community of love uh, that the gospel always uh, develops. And so he gives them some brief uh, observations on what must happen. And like they said in the video, it really, we've got enough to, be, to help them be encouraged that they haven't missed the day of the Lord, but, but not enough to sort out some of the things he says about what needs to happen first. Um, so let's look at the, uh, at the outline. It brings a little more things into focus here. You do divide the book, there's three chapters divided into three major headings. First of all, it was written as 1 Thessalonians from Corinth and written about 51 A.D. So you have, you have 1 Thessalonians going out around 51 A.D. and not too terribly long after that, within that, within that year, here comes 2 Thessalonians trying to address, uh, put yourself where Paul was. Word comes back to him, and it, word doesn't travel quickly now, uh, but someone is, is uh, suggesting in, in Thessalonica that you have written or you've sent word that the day of the Lord has already happened. And so he's, he's uh, very concerned to correct that. So he's the first section. Uh, he's trying to encourage them. The persecution has intensified. Remember, this is, a, this is a religious minority. They are uh, doubted and despised by Romans, Greeks, and Jews. Jews, remember, the, we've talked about this many times in the New Testament, Jews because they, the Jews think they are following a blasphemer 
who claimed to be the Son of God. And so the Jews would see these people as, as just having turned their back on the true and living God. The Romans and the Greeks, because they see these Christians as atheists, atheor, remember? That's the word. Because they reject, they say no to the Roman gods and the Greek gods. And if you've rejected their pantheon of gods, then you're an atheist. You don't believe in God. Get that, get that wrap that, your mind around that. Um, and so they are, they are very uncomfortable people and can be on the receiving end of persecution at any moment. As I mentioned to you this morning, it is happening. It's, I read another article this afternoon uh, in, in, in Beijing. And I think this is the church that we attended when I was there about 18, 19 years ago. That the authorities showed up. They said about uh, 200, I think, authorities. They sent the church members away. Uh, they arrested the pastor and some of the leaders, and they began to uh, shut down. They, they defaced the interior. Uh, they defaced the exterior. Uh, this has suddenly just flared up with, uh, with agitation toward Christians in China. Other, other part of the world, Nigeria, the uh, radical Muslims there, have been capturing specifically pastors and their families. Several, several reports have come to us that they take the pastor and his wife and his children and they burn them alive. And then they have, they have executed uh, 6,000, mostly, mostly women and children uh, who are identified as Christians in Nigeria. This, this is happening today. Um, and, and these folks are facing an intense persecution. If you, can, if you know anything about your Roman history, to have lived under Caligula and Nero, these were vile, wicked men. Nero took the Christians in Rome and would, uh, would soak them in pitch and have them strapped to poles in his gardens and set them on fire and they would be the light for his, uh, his abominable parties. Uh, now they're not in Rome, they're in Thessalonica, but they live under that same oppressive rule. So he's writing to encourage them. And so he starts out giving thanks to them for the growth that's taking place. Let me read that to you. It's, it's his introduction, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul and Silvanus, or Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. That, that is a great encouragement to bear up. It says we're telling people far and wide how you're holding fast, you're enduring in the face of, of growing persecutions, that you're, you're responding to growing persecutions by growing in grace yourself. So he, he begins the letter like that. He gives thanks for their growth. He encourages them in, in the face of persecution, and he prays that God will bless them in that. The second section, chapter 2, he gives them this explanation of the day of the Lord <clears throat> uh, because they're disturbed. As we said, someone's come with a word, perhaps holding a letter, perhaps just a, an, an oral reproduction, they would say, of what Paul has said, that the day of the Lord has already happened, or is, or is happening, it's underway. And then, uh, so he spells out a few events preceding the day. Uh, he gives comfort to them that they themselves will receive comfort on the day of the Lord. I want to just real quickly want to remind you, when you go through the Egyptian plagues leading up to the Exodus, you remember when it, when it went to complete darkness in Egypt, one of the plagues, that light stayed on in Goshen, you remember that? That's a picture of how God watches over his people in the midst of the worst situations. 
That does not mean that Christians will not receive harm. Uh, the Nigerian Christians, if they were standing here tonight, would tell you a very different story. What it does mean, though, is that, that God basically protects his people when he brings judgment on his enemies. So, so he's telling them about that. Uh, and then the third is the exhortation to the church uh, that there's some, the, the disobedience going on there. Uh, people who are embracing this wrong doctrine are being disobedient. People who are, who are concluding that if this is the case, then what, why, uh, why work? He says, wait patiently. Be patient. Patient, remember the word patient has, has about it the idea of enduring. He says to withdraw from the disorderly. I want you to see this in, in chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 6 through 15. He says, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did not have the right but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you are walking in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. There's the, it's the, the picture in the Greek is to mark him out, identify him. When he writes Philippians, he marks out Euodia and Syntyche. Take note of that person. Have nothing to do with him, with him that he might be ashamed. That's the, that's the whole 1 Corinthians 5 mentality, to withdraw such a person that's being immoral in your midst. With such a one, no, not even to eat. You can't have fellowship and break bread with someone who is living intentionally, flagrantly, uh, in, in violation of the word and will of God. That he might be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So you don't, you don't uh, treat him harshly. You don't, you're not mean to him. But you need to send a message. This is not Okay. Now, that, that's been lost in churches today, and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, tragedy uh, that we don't have that in many churches today. All right, and so he brings the conclusion. That's the, that's the outline of it. Um, this second letter, as I said, is a sequel. I want to read to you 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Uh, in the previous letter now, it says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. All right, that's, hang on to that. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you're not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Notice what's been taken out of context here. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night to who? to the people who are presuming upon God, presuming upon the gospel, ignoring the gospel, turning their back on the gospel. He says, you, he says that's, not, that's not you. For that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are children of light, children of the day. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night to those who are walking in darkness. We're not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. I would remind you in Revelation, when we studied through that, we kept coming up on this, this term, the inhabitants of the earth. And I told you then that, that the inhabitants of the earth were the, uh, were the kata oikoi, people, the kata oikos. They, they, kata meaning down, oikos meaning dwell. They were the down dwellers. They were the people who lived for now. They were not living for Jesus and for eternity to come. And so he would contrast that. Peter contrasted that with, the, with the, what they call the paraoikos, the side dwellers. 
And the point John was making uh, in Revelation was that these people, these down dwellers who put their roots down here and, and do not think, do not live for Christ, do not think about him, do not anticipate being with him, that they're the ones that are going to come under the destruction of God. Not the paraoikos, not the, uh, God is not going to destroy his people along with those he judges. That's Paul's message of hope to the Thessalonians. But as I said, they got this letter and then they fall under the spell of these folks promoting error. Um, I read to you uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, a portion of that. Let me pick up, if I may, with uh, chapter 1, verse 5. This is evidence of the, right, of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. See this message? They're troubled. They may have missed the day of the Lord. He says, no, God has, God has you. You're the apple of his eye. He's, he has uh, plans for you. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's basically saying here, if you are suffering, if you're continuing to suffer under persecution, it's because Jesus has not come back. Because when he returns, that's going to stop. They will, verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, glorified in his saints, to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. He's trying to bring correction here to this error that has been, uh, it's infiltrated this congregation. The message is patiently endure affliction. 2 Thessalonians chapter, uh, well, I just read that to you, 1, verses 7 and 8. And he closes with a, with a prayer in chapter 1, uh, verse 11 and 12. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he prays, hold fast, endure. Show the world that your, your desire is to please him, glorify him. That's what it means to be made worthy of his calling. The second major uh, heading, his explanation of the day of the Lord. Um, he addresses the fraudulent nature of this communication that's come into them. Uh, we read a little bit of a while ago, introductorily, in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, being gathered together to him. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. He's describing to them what he has heard is happening to them. Or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let that, don't let that throw you off. It seemed to be, if you can put yourself there, it seemed to be a reversal of what he had written previously and probably what he taught them when he was there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, he assures them that the, that the day of the Lord will be accompanied. Uh, remember, you've got to keep this distinction. People teach this wrong. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. To whom? to those who are living in the dark, to those who are walking in the light, the day of the Lord will come as a great reprieve and blessing. And there's a lot of poor teaching going on that doesn't make that distinction that Paul makes here. So he encourages them that the day of the Lord is future and that they will be found ready for it. That there must be a spiritual rebellion that takes place. And that it will be climaxed by the revealing of, of this satanically empowered, quote, man of lawlessness. Man, that's a key term. The man of lawlessness. The man who, uh, the Antichrist, by the way, I talked to you about this before. 
Antichrist, yes, it can mean against Christ, anti, but that preposition also takes on the force of in the place of. Anyone who would stand in the place of Christ, anyone who would come and claim that he either is Christ or he has come directly from heaven on behalf of Christ, that's antichrist. John says in 1 John, you've heard that antichrist is coming. I'm telling you, many antichrists have gone to the world already. So we've got to recognize this, this idea, this lawlessness. Anytime someone is trying to take away the Christian's understanding that God uh, expect, expects us to live in obedience to him. Remember Jesus says in Matthew 7, Then I will say to them plainly, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's the Greek word anamia, the alpha privative in front of it, which negates the rest of it. Namia would mean uh, living with reference to law. Anomia means living as if there is no law. And so this, this theme never gets away. We're not talking about legalism here. We're not talking about uh, keeping the law in order to be saved. We're talking about uh, the law as a rule of life for the believer, that we recognize that God's character is reflected in that. And we, Paul would say, I delight. In my inmost being, I delight at the law of God in Romans 7. So here's what he says to them. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. You notice that he opposes, but he sits in the place of God, right? Do you have anyone in mind when I read that kind of language to you? Pope Francis is an antichrist. He takes to himself the mantle, the vicar of Christ. He claims to speak when he speaks ex cathedra. Then as Pope, he's, he's so off the walls and so, so departed from Catholic dogma that he's just basically, he's a, he's a Marxist wearing a long white robe, okay, and a, and a beanie. But, but, but the role of Pope is one who stands in the place of Christ. You know where the word Pope comes from? Papa. Papa. Papal. Father. And so it's just an example. There's many, many more. There's many antichrists that have gone in the world, but it's just one that, that comes to mind. Our Baptist forefathers in the 17th century that crafted the 1689 Confession speak to this. If you've read through it seriously, closely, you'll see this in it. Then he goes on and says in, in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And then you just bring some other passages real quickly to bear. I don't want to bog down in this here. Uh, look at Daniel 9, 27. He will make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate uh, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator, the abomination that causes desolation. You've heard that, I'm sure. Chapter 12, verse 11 of Daniel. From that time, from, from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate, desolate is set up, that should be 1,290 days. We're not going to get bogged down in the, in the week, the week and a half, the 1,290 days tonight. But it's to see that this, this picture, this character has been carried throughout Old Testament and New. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken up by the prophet Daniel in these two verses we just read. Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand what's, what's going on. Jesus says, know the signs, recognize the signs. 1 John 2, 18, children, it's the last hour, and as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it's the last hour. And John wrote this 1,900 plus years ago in Revelation 11, 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. There will be martyrs 
We've looked at that before in Revelation. There's a, just as there's a full number of the people of God to be saved, there's a, there's a full number of the martyrs um, who will be executed. And by the way, it's rising. It's rising. More people were martyred for Jesus Christ in the last century, 20th century, than the previous 19 combined. And it's not slowing down in the 21st century. And then Revelation 13, 10, just read that when you get home. We'll not take the time to read that, but it's just another picture. It carries all the way through the, the Old and New Testament of this man of lawlessness. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 9. Uh, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. We read that a while ago. Um, the restraining. Who is the restrainer? Well, there are various views on this. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a prominent one. That he, by God's providence and sovereignty, is holding back the full force of what it would be. Uh, some have suggested that the, that the gospel witness of the church uh, restrains lawlessness. Uh, and as, as the gospel light is advanced, there's a truth to that. The worst thing we can do is, is, uh, is hide our light under a bushel, right? When we hide our light under a bushel, what does that leave? Darkness. Where does this one function? Darkness. And so gospel light uh, drives back darkness. But there is a time coming. So Paul says, how do you respond to this? Well, chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by God, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. In other words, you were the first ones he saved in Thess Thessalonica through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. He's not giving an order there. He's, he's talking about the work of the Spirit and the evidence of that. How do you know that a person has been born again? Anybody can say, well, I've been born again. How do you know that? Belief in the truth. There's an embracing of the truth. And you think about that when you were saved. You didn't become a first-ranked theologian when you were saved, neither did I. But there are things that have the ring of truth about it, and there are things that don't. We say it in different ways. That just, that didn't bear witness with my spirit, and you've got to be careful about that, but that's a part of it, the subjective aspect of when you're hearing truth. Your children learn to recognize your voice. And if a stranger tried to call them, suggesting that it was you, they would, they would perk up. So, so he comforts them with that. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter, either when I was with you teaching or when I wrote you previously. And then now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And then his third heading where he gives this final exhortation to them. He asks them to pray for him and to patiently wait for the Lord. So he asks him first of all in chapter 3 verse 1, finally brothers pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as it happened among you. He says, pray for us as we continue to, to push back barriers that just as the Lord came powerfully in the, remember chapter, chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians 1, our gospel came to you not in word only, but in power accompanied by the Holy Spirit producing deep conviction. You became followers of us and of the Lord. He, he says, we know our gospel. It's not in vain to you. Pray that we'll continue to see that where we're, where we're going. And that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. He's telling them that so that they know, look, it's, it's not unique in Thessalonica. 
Wherever the gospel lands, wherever it advances, it is met with a wicked and evil response. It always has been. He says, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and steadfastness in Christ. We read that earlier when we opened up tonight. We have confidence for you in the Lord. This is what God's going to do for you. So this, he's trying to uh, exhort them. He's trying to show them, we need your prayers too. Yeah, we're praying for you, but we need your prayers. We're, we're suffering at the hands of wicked people. Then he gives that command that we looked at about the disorderly, those who were being idle. We read that earlier. We won't read that again. Um, he challenges them to live a, uh, in chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you. This was chapter 1, chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. Depending on no one. He says, this is the example we ought to set for the community. In past centuries, it was the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that cared, first of all, for its own. And then cared for the poor. And it was one of the, one of the means used to advance the gospel. Then there was a slow, gradual creeping of government intervention. And it ramped up significantly under Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Great Society. I could show you articles that I have on file where during the Great Depression, churches set up almshouses. If men showed up needing help, there was, a, there was one case I remember specifically, they had stacks of wood in the back behind the facility. And a man would go back and chop wood. They used the wood to, to gather for firewood for fireplaces in widows' homes. And if a man would do that, then they would, they would help him, they would assist him. A woman showed up, they had sewing machines uh, in the back of the property. And she would go back and, and be asked to sew and help make clothes for orphan children. Uh, sound familiar? And, the, uh, and that's how they, would, they worked. They didn't just hand out. And then the Great Society comes along, uh, tragic euphemism and and has, has set a gener generation of generation on a, on a dependence on the government a welfare mentality and it's wrecking this culture almost beyond recovery it was the gospel that made the impact and I love the structure that's here it was here before I got here the uh, cold water fund which which helps members the Benevolence Fund, which helps folks outside our congregation. It's a great model uh, drawn from the scriptures. And then he closes with a prayer, of course. So that's a little more extended. Let me, let me pick up the pace. That's a more extended outline of 2 Thessalonians. Um, the title of it, uh, it's not going to surprise you. I should have put it up on the screen. It's, it's Pros uh, Thessalonicus. B. In other words, it's the, it's the second to the Thessalonians. B would be beta. If you read it in Greek, alpha for the first letter, beta for the second. Now, the author, I told you when we looked at 1 uh, at Thessalonians, there was very little disputation that Paul was that author. Um, there's even stronger confidence that this is Paul's letter here. Uh, vocabulary, style, doctrinal content. Uh, supports that it was written by him. And of course, it opens up claiming that. And it closes claiming that, just real quickly. 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul. He just, first of all, signs his name there. That he's, he's writing this. At the end of it, it's very interesting. That, now think about it. Somebody has said there's a document floating around claiming to be from Paul. Notice how he closes this letter. Chapter 3, verse 17. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Paul went through a lot of troubling time, beaten, afflicted, stoned, all sorts of things. And his physical capacity was greatly diminished. 
So much so that some made fun of how he looked, if you follow the Corinthian correspondence carefully, 2 Corinthians. And so it was not unusual for him to have what's called an amanuensis, a, a secretary, a stenographer, who he would dictate his letters to and they would take them down. And notice what he does here. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It's the way I write. So he would, he would affirm in his writing what someone else may have taken down for him. Very interesting, he has the need to do this in the light of what he's battling back in Thessalonica. Well, the date and setting I, I mentioned to you earlier, we went over the setting of this in 1 Thessalonians. I'll simply mention that it's the, uh, the date is 51 AD, best, best chronology we can, we can trace down, and it's from Corinth while he was laboring in Corinth. In Corinth, about a year and a half, remember. Um, look at Acts 18.5. When Silas and Timothy, by the way, Silas is Silvanus, when he uses that, that name uh, for the Thessalonians. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. The Messiah they were looking for was Jesus of Nazareth, the one they crucified. Uh, probably the person who carried the first letter to him comes back and says, you won't believe what's happened in Thessalonica. Uh, and so he writes uh, this second letter. And what he talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, which we've already read to you, verse 11 and 12, becomes more serious. So he writes 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15, which we've also read to you. Uh, opposition to his ministry. Look at Acts 18, 5 to 10. We just read verse 5, but I want to pick up. And when they opposed and reviled him, these, these Jews that he's telling, you know the Christ of, that you're looking for? It's Jesus, whom you crucified. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own hands. I'm innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. This is an incredible victory and no doubt caused Crispus no small amount of heartache. Together with his entire household, many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. In other words, I'm not finished with you here. One of the old writers, I think it was Bradford or someone who said that, that we are invincible until God has finished using us. It's good to know it. We don't need to fear what men can do. God still has a mission for us. No one can harm us to death. What about the theme and the purpose? Um, he's writing to comfort and correct the Thessalonians. And someone has suggested that you can identify three major purposes. First, uh, he wanted to to applaud their continuing growth in faith. He wanted to encourage them because they were discouraged. Encourage them to persevere, bear up under persecution, that God will vindicate his name and his people, and he'll bring vengeance on those who have shown wrath to his people. Second, to correct the false teaching that the day of the Lord was already upon them, or had already come. We've looked at those passages. Just cite them for you again. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. We read over that in our study of 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, that the, uh, the day of the Lord coming. Uh, don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant about those who've fallen asleep. You'll remember that passage well. And then third, to correct a doctrinal error. Paul was all about... He, he, We've used this for you before. Orthodoxy, that is right teaching. If you really believe the truth, 
as it's spelled out in Scripture. In your head and your heart, orthodoxy produces orthopraxy. Orthos just means straight. Straight believing leads to straight living, straight practice, if you please. And so he assures them, if they're living for the Lord, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not. Some people spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out when Jesus is going to come. If you're living for the Lord intentionally, committedly, regularly, you won't be surprised. There will be, there will be a, and I believe part of that is if you're walking in the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, that same Spirit will minister to you and make sure that you are ready. Jesus said, got to be found ready. How can that fit with the day of the Lord like a thief in the night? It fits when we intentionally live for him. That's, that's how you get ready for the return of Christ. Not prophecy conferences. Not the left behind series. You get ready for the return of Christ by living intentionally for him while you live. Walking in the spirit, keeping in step with the spirit, being filled with the spirit. And he says, brothers, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, you're not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. So that's the, that's the picture. Real quickly, the keys to 2 Thessalonians. You, I told you the key phrase we've used as our, as our tag tonight, the expectation of the day of the Lord. Living with that, not letting anyone deceive you with their, with their false teaching. The key verses we read to you at the beginning in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, chapter 3, verse 4 to 5. The key chapter is chapter 2 because that's where Paul gets to the heart of the matter. This is what prompted the letter, this correcting this serious error. And he doesn't want them, if orthodoxy is off, think about it as north on the compass. This is north on the compass. If you're, if you're charting a journey, charting a course, it's important you know where north on the compass is. If you think this is north on the compass, it'll throw you off big time. So Paul wants to be sure he's correcting doctrinal error and keep them knowing what north on the compass is. And so let's get down to seeing Jesus. How do you, where do you see Jesus in, in 2 Thessalonians? I don't know if you know this or not, but the return of Christ is mentioned more than 318 times in the New Testament. Some aspect of the return of Christ, 318 times. The doctrine, the fancy name for the doctrine is the doctrine of eschatology. It's just from the word eschatos, which means the end, last things. I had a professor... Uh, in one of my Greek, uh, my New Testament professors in seminary, Thomas Uri said, he said, you know, eschatology is the doctrine of last things. Why, why do so many people make it the doctrine of first things? Why do they go there? Why do they spend more? See, why don't people spend more time on on justification, sanctification, uh, union with Christ? And it, it goes down this list, of course. It's eschatology. It's the doctrine of last things, and so uh, this doctrine is mentioned more than any other. In, in the Bible, in the New Testament. How should it be viewed, though? If, you're, if the teaching you've received through the years, or if you've read, causes you to be fearful of that day, you've not received it right. You've not been taught it biblically. It should never be used as a scare tactic for a believer who's walking in union with Christ. Rather, it should be reassuring filling you up with joy and hope. Jesus is called the blessed hope. He is not the blessed hope to those depicted in our video a while ago who turned their backs on him, who decided they would live without him, that they could do without him. And because people live that way, eternity guarantees that's how they will spend eternity, without him. Those of us who love him, delight in his will, want to do his, his will, read his word, be washed in his word and filled with his spirit, He's the blessed hope. 
I promise you, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Nigeria need to be reminded that Jesus is the blessed hope. As we climb the list on Wednesday nights to the top, to number one, North Korea, those brothers and sisters in Christ need to be reminded Jesus is the blessed hope. Find joy in Him that He's returning. It does not matter what men are, can do to you, what governments do to you. Jesus is coming for you. And so this is how, the, this is how the, the doctrine of the return of Christ, this is how he's to be seen. But for those who don't know him, there are terrifying implications for his return. Why do you think liberals, progressives, anti-God, types hate the mention of Jesus name Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity in the heart of every creature made in his image and deep down where they're not willing to talk about it they know there is a reckoning coming and they want to forestall that they want to put it off they want to that's the contrast 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. Again, I read a couple of passages. We've started out with them. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. To grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The description in flaming fire. It's not going to flood the world again. The world will be consumed by righteous fire in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God watch this and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus you could read this on those who do not know God even those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ there's a lot of people that say I know God brothers and sisters if they're not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, they, they do not know God. And that's the crowd that we'll hear from Matthew 7 as Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Doesn't he know everything? Yes, he does. That little word, K-N-E-W, used by God, used by Jesus, is a word of relationship. I never had a relationship with you. Verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. The description in Scripture is where the flame burns and never goes out. Where did we see that? Where did we bump into that in the Old Testament? Do you remember? The burning bush. The bush burned and was not consumed. What is this? I am. I am. God's first encounter with Moses was to present himself as a bush being consumed with fire that was never consumed. Eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Very, not from his might. See, God's, God's might has a glory about it. To deliver his people. There is a terror of his might. They will not escape that. They will not be cast away from that. The glory of his might, this word glory, remember, has its idea about the, sh the shining, the Shekinah, the brilliant brightness that, that fills everything. And for those who know him, brings comfort. And warmth. The old, you've seen the, the example of a fire, a campfire. If you move too far away from a campfire, what do you get? Cold. <laughs> Doesn't do you any good. You move too close to a campfire, what do you get? Burned. It talks about the terror that is coming. Verse 10, when he comes on that day 
to be glorified in his saints. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. When he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who are... You, see, you hear what they're hearing? Hope. Hope. Unless somebody tell you you've missed it, God has great plans for you. He intends to, to glorify himself in you on that day. For all who have believed... Because of our testimony to you was believed. You believed me when we told you. Well, let somebody come along and sideswipe you. So we let's drop down to Second Thessalonians two, verse ten. With all the wicked deception for those who are perishing, he's talking about how Satan, the false signs, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. You get the picture here? This idea of being saved, well I I ask Jesus into my heart. Do you love the truth? Do you obey the gospel? That's what the scripture says salvation is. That's when you know salvation has come. Verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. You see what he's warning them about here? Don't fall into that delusion of this, this false word going around about this. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth. Another contrast here but had pleasure in, right, in unrighteousness. Where's your pleasure? Where's your pleasure? Well, it's contribution. We'll wrap it up with this. What's the contribution of 2 Thessalonians to the, to the Word of God? It's the shortest of the nine letters to churches that Paul writes. That's the first thing that kind of sets it apart. But it really adds to 1 Thessalonians and some very critical information about uh, end times uh, clarifies some things for us otherwise we that we would not know otherwise uh, we don't know who we can't identify as the man of lawliness I think you can identify with antichrists perhaps not the antichrist when you take the Thessalonian letters first and second Thessalonians and Matthew 24 and 25, which is called the Little Apocalypse. In other words, it's a smaller expression of what the larger book of Revelation is. Those are the three major prophetic texts of the New Testament. Written in 51 AD, if you, if you embrace what we taught you, what Josh was teaching you on Galatians, the Galatians uh, written around 44 AD or so, this is one of the earliest letters couple of letters Paul wrote. And there's some things that shows you that it already becomes settled truth in the church in terms of doctrine. He refers to these as the traditions I taught you. Um, one writer observed, I thought this was interesting, these two letters refer to almost every central doctrine of the Christian faith, even though they are not doctrinal treatises like Romans, chapter 1 through 11, and then chapter 12, the practical, or Ephesians. And then in spite of how short this is, three chapters, there are four prayers Paul offers in this letter. And as I told you earlier, it closes with a greeting in his own handwriting as it says this this is a the, the two letters together I would, if you haven't read them in a while just encourage us to take some time they're not they take long to read read first and second Thessalonians with the understanding of what happened in between the writing of them and see what Paul is saying to these people how, how we can have hope and then then as you pray pray for brothers and sisters you know who are who are suffering pray for brothers and sisters around the world who are really bearing up under the, the, the wrath of persecution toward them. It's not getting any better. It's not letting up. And according to what Paul writes here, we have no reason to believe it will or should. What we should think is, when's it coming here? <laughs>